Real YouTubists used Executor. Today I will talk about World 2012. Hello, my fellow gamists. Hello. Today I'm going to be doing something a little different. Some of you who watch my channel are probably aware that I am the 2016 Pokemon World Champion. I almost never mentioned this anywhere, so if you didn't already know before this, don't feel too bad about it. Today, however, we'll be talking about not when I won the World Championships, but when I placed second all the way back in 2012. For whatever reason, I don't often talk about the World Championships I've participated in, aside from Worlds 2016, despite the fact that I've played in every one that's happened since I started competing back in 2011. Funnily enough, I started my channel in the spring of 2016, a few months before I won the World Championships. Before Worlds 2016, however, the tournament I was probably best known for is the one we're talking about today, and the Pokemon I was most commonly associated with was Executor, to the point where I even helped run a website for a year with Executor-inspired branding. Because of when I started my channel and how much my channel has grown since Sword and Shield release, I thought this could be a good time to share one of my favorite teams I've ever made with you all. Before we talk about the team, we have to talk about the format and the metagame. For anyone unaware, the format refers to the Pokemon that are legal per the rules, and the metagame refers to the Pokemon that people are actually using within that rule set. 2012 took place in Pokemon Black and White and was our first National Dex format in Generation 5, meaning nearly every Pokemon was legal aside from the restricted Pokemon and mythical Pokemon. Unlike every following generation, Generation 5 was the last generation to not have a core gimmick. This was a time before Mega Evolution, Z-Moves, or Dynamax. What Gen 5 did have, however, were gems. Gems back then were like consumable choice band or choice specs. They had typings, and when you used a move of that type and it connected, that move would become 1.5 times as strong, and the gem would disappear afterwards. Missing a move, or using a move into protect, would not activate the gem. You needed to actually do damage. For that reason, 2012 was in large part defined by a number of powerful gem-boosted moves. One of the biggest defenders was Latios, who used Dragon Gem paired with Draco Meteor. Latios was fast for the format, and also had access to good support moves like Tailwind and Substitute. When you were EV training your Pokémon, this was almost always the first Pokémon you would consider. Latios wasn't the only offender though. Many players used Fighting Gem Hitmontop to offer the usual Fake Out and Intimidate support, in addition to a very powerful close combat. Not every Pokémon needed a gem, however. Pokemon like Tyranitar and Garchomp were very popular due to their excellent natural base stats. To me, 2012 was the last format before Intimidate felt really necessary. The game was newer back then, and players were still figuring out what was really strong, and there was no Landorus Therian or Incineroar, so the general power of Intimidate Pokemon was a lot lower. Because of this, physical attackers were much more viable than they are nowadays. In addition to Hitmontop, there were two primary support Pokemon, Cresselia and Thunderous. Bulky Thunderous had an enormous spike in popularity after Ray Rizzo won the World Championships with it the previous year, and to say it was a menace would be an understatement. Thunderous had access to a 100% accurate Priority Thunder Wave that worked on both Electric and Dark types, 90% accurate Swagger with Confusion that activated 50% of the time, other good supporting moves like Taunt and Substitute, and one of the highest natural special attack stats in the game. It could be used with defensive items or offensive ones like Gems. It was one of the most dynamic and frustrating Pokemon to go up against. We also have Cresselia. While not quite as annoying as Thunderous, Cresselia was arguably the best Pokemon in the game. It has incredible natural bulk, and a wide range of supporting moves like Icy Wind, Helping Hand, Trick Room, and many more. Here's a list of every support move that Cresselia I played against in 2012 had at one point or another. Cresselia would sit on the field for ages, and generally be a nuisance, disrupting your team, and to make matters even worse, if you underestimated it, you might take heavy damage from a choice spec set, or even an expert belt set that both Aaron Zeng and I used only a month before the World Championships to win nationals in the senior and masters divisions. The last thing I'll say about 2012 is that for me, it was the perfect format for competitive Pokemon. So many Pokemon were viable, but there was also a healthy metagame that developed which made sure it didn't become too decentralized. This is the format where I made so many weird ideas work for me, like where I got second at regionals with Confuse Ray, Thunder Wave, Wide Guard, Rock Slide, Regigigas. It's been fun for me to work on this video, as I've been able to dive back into this format I love so much, so if you're watching this, thank you. Now, let's talk about the team we came here to talk about. 
Even though this video is about Executor, I have to explain a bit about the main strategy of the team before we get there. Before Nationals, I stumbled upon something interesting. I learned about a strategy that was used in 2010 before I started playing with Venomoth and Kyogre, where Venomoth would use Skill Swap on Kyogre to reset the Drizzle ability and to give Tinted Lens to Kyogre, making its Water Spout even stronger. This got me thinking about the move Skill Swap. In my two years playing VGC at the time, I hadn't run into the move Skill Swap a single time. Skill Swap is a move that switches the abilities of the user and the target, so it doesn't offer any damage or speed support most of the time. I decided to look through the list of Pokemon that learned Skill Swap, and I came across something interesting. Cresselia got access to Skill Swap. We've already talked about why Cresselia was good, but Levitate might not seem like an especially interesting ability to switch around. In most cases, immunity to the ground typing isn't worth using a move slot just to pass around. However, that's only in most cases. I realized that if you paired Cresselia with Heatran, you would form an incredibly potent combination. Cresselia and Heatran were the central duo of my team. The theory is pretty simple. Heatran has good natural bulk and, back in Generation 5, Steel resisted Ghost and Dark, giving it extremely good defensive typing. Heatran had two major weaknesses, super effective moves and its middling speed stat. Cresselia solved both of these weaknesses. Like I mentioned earlier, Cresselia is extraordinarily bulky. What this means is that it can sit in the field for a long time without fearing much. I used the move Icy Wind on Cresselia, which allowed me to lower both my opponent's speed stats so that Heatran and Cresselia could outspeed them. Once I had the speed advantage, I could attack to do damage, or use Substitute with Heatran safely. Heatran's other weaknesses involved its typing. Heatran has three weaknesses, ground, fighting, and water. By using Skill Swap, I can switch Heatran's Flash Fire ability with Cresselia's Levitate ability, taking Heatran from a 4 times weakness to ground to an immunity. Additionally, I ran the move Sunny Day on my Cresselia. It not only helped my rain matchup, which I was worried about, it also removed Heatran's water weakness and boosted its fire type attacks. Heatran's final weakness was fighting. Not only did Cresselia have a positive type matchup against most of the popular fighting types at the time, Heatran also ran the Chopperberry to mitigate super effective damage from fighting types. With this level of support, my Heatran could effectively eliminate all of its weaknesses. The reason this combination was so potent was because many teams at the time relied on a few specific tools to deal with Heatran, the best example being Garchomp. At Worlds 2012, there were many games where the advantage I gained by giving Heatran Levitate, or by setting up the sun for it, was so enormous that I was able to convert it into a win. It was incredibly satisfying to see how much one unorthodox move could completely alter the way games played out. I learned throughout the course of this tournament that Skill Swap was a very powerful move even aside from Heatran. Many Pokemon like Thunderous relied on their abilities, and I was able to support the team by passing around my own Intimidate or by stealing an opponent's Intimidate, to name a few examples. At this point, you might be thinking, that Heatran sounds like a pain to deal with. But believe it or not, we aren't even done talking about the support for it just yet. This is where we can finally talk about Executor. Executor caught my eye because it had access to the ability Harvest, which we'll talk about in a second. But in looking at it, I realized it actually has perfect synergy with Heatran. Heatran is weak to Fighting, Water, and Ground, all of which Executor resists, and Executor is weak to Fire, Bug, Poison, Flying, Ice, Dark, and Ghost, all of which Heatran resisted in Generation 5. So, Obviously, Executor had the typing it needed, but there was more to it than that. Executor had access to the ability Harvest. What Harvest does is at the end of each turn, if your Pokemon had consumed a berry item during the battle, it would have a 50% chance of getting that berry back. There's a special condition as well that if Sun is up, that 50% chance increases to 100%. I already had Sun on my team, and the perfect defensive solution for Executor. I trained my Executor to survive the strongest moves in the format that I could, such as Latios, Dragon Gem, Draco Meteor. I was amazed in practice as my Executor was able to completely shut down teams that couldn't remove it, thanks to how powerful Harvest was. Despite being trained totally defensively, Executor still was able to do damage thanks to it having a very high base special attack stat of 125, the same as Thunderous. I was on a bit of a weird move kick, and so I decided to run a very strange Executor set. Protect, Psy Shock, Leaf Storm, and Power Swap. Power Swap switches changes to the offensive stats with a target. This meant that I could Leaf Storm, go to minus 2 special attack, then use Power Swap and give that minus 2 to my opponent and be ready for another Leaf Storm. It also theoretically allowed me to pass Intimidates back to my opponents or Swagger to my teammates. Looking back on it, I think a set with Giga Drain and Leech Seed probably would have been better, but Power Swap Leaf Storm definitely had some moments. I then added Hitmontop for Intimidate support, but I ran a very strange set that was extremely defensive and had the move rest with the item Chestaberry. In hindsight, I think this was suboptimal, but 2012 Wolf was not going to be deterred. 
A fun fact about the team is that at the time, between Heatran, Executor, and Hitmontop, I resisted every single type at least one time. With Hitmontop providing Intimidate and Fakeout support, Executor's literally unlimited recovery, Cresselia's phenomenal natural bulk, and Heatran's insane defensive typing and support, the defensive backbone of my team was extraordinarily strong. I added Thunderous for Thunder Wave support and made it faster and less bulky than most other Thunderous so I could taunt them before they paralyzed my whole team. Unfortunately, other people at Worlds 2012 had the same idea, so my Thunderous ended up slower than most opposing ones I played. I gave Thunderous the Electric Gem so that I could do a bit more damage. I closed out my team with Choice Band Adamant Terrakion. This Pokemon provided some much needed damage on a team that was severely lacking offensively, and because Intimidate was much less common and Pokemon were slower overall back in 2012, this Terrakion was effectively just a delete button most of the time. I think a strength of this team was that it really took advantage of the timer rules back in 2012. Each turn you had 45 seconds to make your move, and the battle would end after 15 minutes had passed from the start of the battle. There was so much HP to chew through and so many passive effects on this team that if I wanted I could take most battles to timer. My memory is a bit hazy, but I believe in my top 8 set against Seijin, I won the first game with 3 Pokemon left on his side and 4 on my side, and the second game with 4 Pokemon left on each side, meaning there was only one Pokemon KO'd across both games. I mentioned earlier that this team is one of my favorite teams that I've ever built, but it's also really interesting to look back on because I think that this team was where I started building a lot of really bad habits that would take me years to undo. This team has an absurd focus on defensive synergy and bulk, and is really lacking in offense across the board. It's a good reminder that a team can do well and have good ideas, but still be fundamentally flawed. I arrived at Worlds 2012 determined to do better than I had the previous year, when I placed 6th with a Trick Room team featuring Embor. Worlds was an amazing experience. It was in Kona, Hawaii, and I had been lucky enough to win a trip thanks to winning Nationals. This was also the trip where I met Marcus and Billa, two of my best friends from Pokemon to this day. They actually helped me prepare for my top 8 match the night before, despite us not knowing each other very well. The tournament had two phases, 6 rounds of Swiss followed by a top 8 cut. I went 4 wins and 2 losses, losing to South Korea's Seijin Park and Spain's Abel Sands, and entered top 8 as the 6th seed. The funny thing was, my first opponent in the top 8 was Seijin, and my second was Abel. The matchup against Seijin was difficult for me. He had Focus Sash Bisharp, which applied a lot of pressure to my Cresselia and Terrakion, as well as Hitmontop. This lead was strong into my team because only Executor and Heatran had Protect, making the combination of Fakeout and Bisharp very potent. In Game 1, I was able to get around this by leading my Executor, and with the knowledge that I could take a Night Slash without fainting, I used Leaf Storm to break Bisharp's Focus Sash to set myself up for success in the rest of the game. Thankfully, Game 1 we actually have footage of, and as I mentioned earlier, it ends with a 4-3 win in my favor on the timer. The last turn actually took a full 5 minutes on its own. Unfortunately, no record of Game 2 exists. I moved on to top 4, and was up against my other loss from the Swiss rounds, Abel Sands. This is probably a good time to talk about the stream itself. When I started in 2011, my entire first year, there was no stream of the events. Community members would take it upon themselves to bring their own recording equipment, in the hopes of preserving some of the games. Starting with Worlds 2012, Pokemon decided to try streaming their World Championships. They brought in GameSpot, and although it was good to have some recording, there were a number of problems. The commentators unfortunately didn't understand how Pokemon worked, and provided a lot of incorrect information. There was also this fun quirk where they cut mid-game to the other game during Top 4. Here's some footage to give you an idea. Seems to be working well. Alright, so now we're going to take a look at Guillermo and uh, Ray Rizzo. Oh no, sorry, that's Wolf. Wolf Glick. They're deep in the action right now. Now we're taking a look at the gameplay from uh, Wolf Glick and Guillermo Castillo Diaz. I believe Wolf is uh, on top with Cressilia and Thunderous. What's going on in this game? How many Pokemon are left? I have absolutely no clue and I was the one playing. As you'll see, they also tended to cut away from the game to show the players not during the time when players were thinking, but when they were actually playing. Here you can see me throw my hands up because something happened, but unfortunately I have no idea what it is. Before we can see what's happening, they cut back to the other game. I hope you enjoyed that 30 seconds of gameplay. By the time they return to my match, it's basically the end of game 1. Nobody has any idea what's happening, but I win the Latios vs Heatran and Thunderous endgame narrowly. A cut back to the other game follows, and once that wraps up, we jump into game 2, which is about halfway done. I'm able to use Terrakion to take out the hit on top. Then position my Executor with some Icy Wind and Sun supports to finish off the Tyranitar, leaving only Metagross locked into Bullet Punch when the battle ends. I'd managed to beat both my losses from the day before without losing a game, and I was into the finals of the World Championships. 
Side note, I actually won every individual game I brought Executor to this entire tournament. The biggest difference between the games I lost the prior day and the games I won in top 8 was the fact that I decided to bring Executor, and it had really pulled its weight. Even though Executor wasn't the main strategy of my team initially, the role it filled was incredibly crucial to my victory. I was in the finals against Ray Rizzo, the then two-time world champion and the same person who had eliminated me from top 8 the prior year. I was convinced I would win. It would make such a nice story after all. And so I rolled up and promptly got decimated. I had some bad information going in and my game plan was not as good as I thought it was. I think I also folded a bit under the pressure. I wish I'd been able to give Ray a better performance, as this was the last world championships where he was anywhere near full strength in my opinion. I don't really want to go into detail on the match here because this video is already a bit longer than I intended and I didn't even use Executor in the finals anyway, but if you'd be interested in watching a breakdown of how I lost in the world's finals, let me know in the comments down below. And thus my world championship run was over. At the time, I was really upset having come so close to winning and getting destroyed, but in hindsight I think I wasn't mature enough to handle the title back in 2012, and I think if I'd won then, I'd probably have solidified my bad habits and stagnated really hard. Looking back, I wouldn't change how I played even though it was a major failure for me at the time. And that's the whole story. It was fun for me to go back through this bit of my own VGC history, so I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any feedback or suggestions for more videos like this, leave me a comment down below. Um, it's me. <laughs> World Chip difference, baby. Metagross is one of the few high-end Pokemon that is a strong pick against Garchomp. And part of this is, is 15 minutes uh, for play instead of some of the earlier events, mm -hmm. which had seven or eight minute timers. Yeah. Uh, and it's a sad thing to do. All right, look, what's happening here? All right, that's it. We got... That was just one. Trump is Dragon type, so Metagross is you know a good, a uh, good strong choice against a Garchomp attack. Mm -hmm. And for the check. folks at home, yeah. just looking at the the text on the screen there, don't be mistaken. This truly is the World Championships. I mean, there's uh, what appears to be Japanese on the screen and English up top. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I'm Each of the fine. players, I'm and Garchomp is not super great against Metagross because mm -hmm. a lot of his heavy hitting moves are going to deal less damage to Metagross. Looks like they may have been a critical hit. It was it was definitely critical. Heard up. Uh, they're not quite as sturdy. She's kind of support Pokemon designed to not nearly what it would have been. Ooh, not critical. Looks like a critical, and that is. We've got Metacross on Rizzo's side, which is a very strong Pokemon to be out when his opponent's forced to have Garnchomp. The wolf. The wolf. The wolf is a is a is a there was a fan favorite, he is, right? Yeah, he's part of Team Swag, favorite. right? Is that? I I have heard Team Swag done about. Team Swag has been kind of uh, you know, swow. I, I was corrected. It's Ray Rizzo versus Joe Wachowski, the wolf. Serious? He looks like Ray is uh, subbing in a. Oh no. What what kind of attack was that? Are there... uh, that looks like. Well, it was, it was definitely super effective. Um, and I've seen some some Latios being paired up with that kind of earthquake overall ground attack attacks. Uh, Thunderous also has a hits everybody on the field attack. And who's that other Pokemon right there? Is that, that uh, uh, Can? And two, so he's he's really focused on Heatran sticking around for the long Ooh. haul. Thunderous just got dealt a critical hit. And Guillermo's got Roton and Exadrill. Exadrill. Exadrill is, I believe, ground type? Yes. Uh, and as, uh, you know, as the fighting, he's going to be strong against, uh, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Avalanche is one of those, you know, moves we're seeing a lot of this weekend. Yep. Those bubbles going up and those bubbles going down yep. are, you know, stat pumps or stat debuffs. Um, Avalanche is uh, an ice type move, yes. which you know is a decision as to what Pokemon we're going to see, what types. So, you know, it's it's a gamble as to what you're going to see, but it's good against fire type. Both of Ash's Pokemon are water types, and they're totally weak against. Go ahead and hashtag PokeWorlds. We'll be checking all of the uh, social media feeds to take your comments, questions, concerns. Oh, looks like uh, 
Tyranitar <laughs> just just got fainted. He's done. Sit down, Tyranitar. So that's that's the drain. That's him healing himself while attacking. Uh-huh. Um, which is again. That's it. I'm out of here.